Hey, this is Jeff, and today I want to take a quick look at termination and sensitive amplifiers in the context of RF circuits. Uh, so what is a termination and sensitive amplifier? Uh, termination and sensitive amplifier is uh, simply a circuit block, an amplifier block, uh, that presents a constant finite input impedance and a constant output impedance, which don't necessarily have to be the same, while exhibiting some useful gain across the amplifier. Uh, so to put it another way, if I have a a block diagram here with my termination and sensitive amplifier right in the middle there, that uh, no matter what the characteristic impedance of the preceding block here, this X block is, uh, you will always see a constant impedance looking into the amplifier, when you call that Z in, and uh, whatever I hang off the output end of the amplifier here, this Y block, uh, will constantly be fed with a constant output impedance, uh, this is called Z out for this case, uh, and most importantly, that no matter what the input impedance is of this block Y, this block X will always see the same input impedance and vice versa. No matter what I'm feeding this amplifier with, uh, the output block will always see this constant output impedance Z out. Or to put it another way, uh, a termination and sensitive amplifier uh, isolates the adjacent blocks from one another uh, while providing them with the same input and output impedance as they would normally see while providing some gain across the amplifier block. So why is having an amplifier block with consistent input and output impedance a useful thing to have in the context of RF circuitry? Well, there are uh, several RF circuit blocks that really only behave as intended when they're presented with the proper uh, impedance on all ports. And a big one of those is uh, RF mixer circuits. Uh, an RF mixer, if it's not presented with the appropriate uh, impedance at all of its inputs and outputs, uh, whether that's a, a diode ring mixer or a Gilbert cell mixer, or whatever kind of mixer you have, if your input and output impedance doesn't match the designed impedance of that circuit, uh, you can get intermodulation, additional harmonic distortion, and all kinds of other unintended things. You can imagine if I have a, a signal coming into this generic mixer here and mixing with some kind of oscillator, say, if I don't have a proper impedance match to the next part of my circuit, I'll have signals coming out of my mixer, reflecting off of that impedance mismatch, and going right back into my mixer to mix with all of the other frequency products that are already there. Uh, I certainly don't need additional mixing products coming out of my mixer if I can avoid it. I really would like to isolate whatever one I'm trying to extract. Another circuit block that benefits from impedance matching is uh, any kind of analog filter. An RC filter, RLC filter, uh, crystal filter uh, are all uh, sort of dependent on having the proper impedance matching on their inputs and their outputs. The characteristics of those filters, the bandpass ripple, the cutoff frequency, the steepness of the skirts, all assume that they're operating within an environment that has a, a consistent specific impedance, uh, and being able to provide that impedance within an amplifier block can be useful. Uh, and one more benefit that uh, the TIA amp provides is uh, some experimental stability. Um, it's nice to know when you're troubleshooting a circuit, say, or building a circuit for the first time, that your amplifier block as a whole will present a consistent impedance no matter if you take it out of the circuit and examine it separately or parallel it with some other piece of equipment or feed its import or output into a piece of test gear. That amplifier will always have the same impedance. Um, then to, just to dive a little more into that, um, let's take a quick look at... Uh, this uh, real basic super heterodyne receiver architecture, um, you know, where your signal would come in from an antenna, pass through, say, some kind of input bandpass filter, a little preamplification, go through your first mixer of some kind, fed by a variable frequency oscillator to some IF frequency, a little IF filter in the middle here, surrounded by a little IF amplification. We go through a second mixer down to audio frequencies, a little audio filtering, a little final audio amp, and uh, a speaker or headphones coming out the other end. You know, sort of a very general, you know, a single conversion super heterodyne architecture. But let's say as I'm building this, that I would like to test just the second half of the receiver. I'd love to make sure that uh, this mixer and the BFO and the audio frequency circuitry is all working. And uh, I'd like to do that by just replacing all of the earlier parts of the circuitry with my signal generator. I just want to inject a little RF here, mix it with my BFO, see if any audio squirts out the far end.
Well, if this is a generic amplifier, which is to say a termination sensitive amplifier, then the impedance that this mixer is going to see coming out of this amplifier is dependent on the impedance of my signal generator, which is probably not the behavior that I want. I'm, I may have a signal generator that has a very consistent uh, impedance, uh, and that may reflect through this amplifier in a useful way to give me the impedance on the output that I want. Um, but essentially for that to be true, the signal generator would have to have the same impedance as what it's replacing, in other words, the backside of this IF filter. And it would be really nice if I didn't have to rely on that to be true. Now, if this is a termination insensitive amplifier, I know that at this output, I'm always going to see the same impedance, whether I have a signal generator here, whether I have a whole super hat radio here, whether I have nothing at all here, and I just leave this open in the air. I mean, I'm not going to get any signal through that way, but at least the impedance that I'm seeing at this mixer will be consistent. So for debugging and troubleshooting, having a, an amplifier with consistent impedance can be helpful. So before we get to taking a look at some termination and sensitive amplifier circuitry, I wanted to run through a few things that aren't termination and sensitive amplifiers. Remember we said that a, a TIA is a circuit block that presents a constant input impedance and output impedance while exhibiting useful gain. Uh, so some things that don't qualify include your classic buffer circuits. And, and speaking generically here, a buffer is going to be something typically with a high input impedance that's not going to unnecessarily load the earlier parts of your circuitry uh, and uh, would have a low output impedance so it doesn't have a problem driving the later parts of your circuitry. Um, but a buffer, sort of by definition, is something with uh, unity gain, maybe a little less than unity gain, something that's meant to help uh, the earlier parts of our circuit drive the later parts. If it had a higher gain than one, we'd call it an amplifier. Um, other things that are not uh, termination sensitive amplifiers are your classic resistive pad. Uh, if you wanted to help your earlier circuitry see a specific impedance uh, or present a more unified impedance to the later parts of your circuitry, you might use a resistive pad uh, specified for some amount of loss uh, at uh, a consistent uh, impedance. Uh, but again, by definition, it's going to have a gain less than one, maybe a lot less than one. Maybe this is a 10 dB pad where only a tenth of the power is making it through. Uh, and finally, uh, most amplifiers, uh, just drawn a common emitter amplifier here for, for interest, um, are also not termination insensitive. They're what we might call termination sensitive, uh, which is to say they exhibit sort of exactly the property we don't want in that the uh, the impedance that's being presented to this output circuitry will depend on the impedance of the input circuitry and, and vice versa. Um, not to say that these circuits aren't useful. Certainly they can have plenty of gain, 15, 20 dB of gain, maybe more if you're careful, uh, but they don't exhibit this constant impedance input and output that we're looking for. So let's take a quick look at that on the bench. So I've got built up on the bench here essentially the same common emitter amplifier we were looking at in the example a moment ago. I've got my signal generator hooked up just here through a piece of coax, and right now that generator is set up for about a one kilo ohm source impedance. That's AC coupled into the amplifier, and with the appropriate biasing details and a little emitter degeneration, a little decoupling for the power supply, we're uh, AC coupled to the output. And right now I'm just using this 500 ohm rotary pot for our load to give us something that we can adjust to see what happens. I know it's not the most uh, RF appropriate load, um, but we're going to be running our signal generator at about 100 kilohertz for the sake of this demo, so I think we'll take our chances. So let's swing over to the oscilloscope and uh, check things out. So right now I've got two probes hooked up to this amplifier. The uh, top trace here is probing at the output to the amplifier just across the load, and the bottom trace here is probing at the input to the amplifier just at the signal generator. And if you're wondering why the uh, output of this amplifier is showing so much less voltage than the input of the amplifier, and I, I did promise this thing was going to have some gain after all, um, and yes they are in the same vertical scale, it's because right now I've got this pot, our load, turned all the way down as low as it'll go trying to be zero ohms or essentially just a dead short to ground at this point. So this point is not going to develop a whole lot of voltage. Or in other words, I'm presenting a very low impedance load to this amplifier. But if you watch this trace as I just turn the knob on that pot, you'll see uh, as I increase that load towards maximum of about 500 ohms. There we go. Now this looks more like a common emitter amplifier relationship, right? I've got a small input voltage. I have a large output voltage. It's an inverting amplifier. You know, this 
looks like a common emitter amp. Uh, but uh, let me turn the uh, turn this pot back down again, and this time watch what happens to the input voltage as I uh, increase the impedance uh, that's being seen by the amplifier at the output. You'll notice as the output impedance increases, this voltage goes down. The, the voltage seen at the input to this amplifier is getting smaller, and this uh, drives us towards uh, something that is true of uh, common emitter bipolar amplifiers, is that they are not termination insensitive. Uh, the fact that by changing the impedance seen at the output, we changed the loading essentially that was being seen by this signal generator that we were, you know, this was being affected by what was seen at the output, leads us to the conclusion that common emitter amplifiers are termination transparent. Now that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the impedance at the output is going to be the same as the impedance seen by the input. In fact, sort of the opposite, right? We saw that increased impedance in this load led to uh, less impedance being seen by the previous stage. But in, nevertheless, the two are related so that these are not termination insensitive amplifiers. Having looked at a lot of things that are not termination insensitive amplifiers, let's look at an honest to goodness termination insensitive amplifier design. Uh, this one is from Wes Hayward, W7ZOI. Uh, and actually, if you Google W7ZOI termination insensitive amplifier, you will find his excellent paper uh, on this subject that uh, this whole design is wholesale lifted from. So go check it out. That's really going back to first sources on this one. Now this may look a little bit more complicated than the amplifier we were just looking at, but uh, let's break it down just a little bit. So the first part of this amplifier is just a common emitter amplifier, like we were just seeing. It's got a slightly different biasing scheme, it's got a, a slightly different feedback mechanism, but at the end of the day, it's a common emitter amplifier and it's going to provide us a lot of gain. Uh, in fact, all of the gain is present in this amplifier block. This one's set up for about 15 dB of gain. It's also set up for a 50 ohm input. As we saw a moment ago, when we uh, adjust the output impedance of a common emitter amplifier, we also adjust the input impedance looking into the amplifier. Uh, and this one is a choice of value such that if there were no load on the output of this amplifier, we would see a 50 ohm input impedance. And that's a function of three components. This uh, 330 ohm load resistor here, this 680 ohm feedback resistor here, and uh, the 180 ohm emitter to generation resistor down here. Now you can Google uh, a number of resources, including another paper by W7ZOI, that explain where those numbers actually come from. It's, it's a slightly involved process, but suffice it to say, there's equations that you can punch uh, your desired input impedance and gain into and out pop these values. So go check that out if you're wanting to design one of these on your own. Now I did say that the input impedance here would be 50 ohms if there were no load on this amplifier, but uh, we're gonna need to put a load of some kind on it or it's no good to us. So let's take a look at the next stage. The next stage is just gonna be a common collector amplifier, a buffer, which we said earlier uh, is going to have a very high input impedance and a nice low output impedance. So a high input impedance means we're really not going to load this earlier amplifier down by much, if at all. And uh, just to help things a little more, we're going to follow that with another common collector amplifier stage, another high input impedance, low output impedance stage, to really try and minimize the amount that we're loading this uh, gain stage down, trying to keep this as close to 50 ohms as possible. So we have our 50 ohm input impedance, or close enough. We have about 15 dB of gain, so we have a useful amount of gain here. So all that we need to do to make this a full termination insensitive amplifier is to have a fixed and constant output impedance. Well, since the output impedance of this second buffer stage is so low, you know, a handful of ohms at most, uh, we can just follow this with a series resistor that essentially is the output impedance we would like to see. In this case, for a 50 ohm output, chose a common value and uh, use a 51 ohm resistor here. And that 51 ohms in series with a tiny output resistance of this buffer stage and in parallel with this, uh, this uh, 470 ohm resistor that's there to set the bias point, uh, provides our output impedance. Essentially, you can make this resistor the output impedance you'd like to see from this amplifier for any you know low value of uh, output impedance. Uh, so I've gone ahead and built up this circuit on a piece of copper, and it is a little bit more involved uh, than the last one we saw, but essentially you can see our three transistors in a line and their various uh, capacitors linking them all together. Got my signal generator coming in here, and this is still set up for about a 1K uh, a one kilo ohm source impedance, just so we can check out the loading on that. And once again, I'm using this uh, 500 ohm pot as our load. And apologies to the RF purists out there, but I think it'll work fine for this demo. So let's take this over to the scope and check it out.
As before, we've got uh, two probes on this amplifier. The top trace here is our, our output, just across that 500 ohm pot we're going to use as an adjustable load. And the bottom trace here being uh, at the input, just, uh, just after our signal generator. Uh, and uh, like before, this pot is turned all the way down as close to zero ohms as it'll go, so shorting that point to ground, not developing much voltage here. And uh, just as before, as I turn up the impedance of uh, our load here, you can see uh, our output voltage starting to rise at that point. Well, it's about 500 ohms, and look at all that useful gain we've got. You know, about 15 dB of gain between those two traces, which is great. But notice that as I adjust this pot, in other words, change the uh, loading on this amplifier, changing the impedance that this output is seeing, this input trace hardly changes at all. It's not perfect. I mean, nothing's perfect in the real world, but instead of that extreme loading we were seeing with just the plain common emitter amplifier, we now have a very solid impedance being seen by our signal generator. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the impedances are matched. In fact, with my signal generator set up for about uh, a one kilo ohm uh, input uh, source impedance and this amplifier providing a, a 50 ohm match, the match is not good, but it is consistent. And that is the point of termination in sensitive amplifiers. Of course, there are other termination and sensitive amplifier designs, some based on similar principles and some which vary slightly. Here's another design from W7ZOI in that same paper. This one actually starts with a common base amplifier. You can see the signal coming in through the emitter of this MPN transistor. And then it too has a common collector buffer and a series resistor to set the output impedance. And from that same paper, here's actually a, a, another termination insensitive amplifier, which just has two common collector stages and then some transformer action to set the final output impedance. Uh, Wes Hayward calls this not a termination insensitive design, but says it has a reduced termination sensitivity, so this one may be worthy of some um, further study. And then one more design I want to share because I think it's really nifty is from the author of redeyeprep.wordpress.com. And I'm so sorry, Word I Prep. And no matter how hard I tried, I could not find your call sign. So if you ever watch this, uh, shoot me an email and uh, we'll get you properly credited here. So what's a little uh, neat, if a little confusing at first, about this design is it looks like it's a giant ring. Uh, so if you imagine a signal coming in here, we have a, a common collector, you know, some kind of buffer stage, and then we have a, a common emitter amplifier, and then a buffer stage, and then an amplifier, and then that output is tied right back to the beginning. So either this thing is going to be a giant oscillator, or something else very strange is happening. And uh, something else strange is happening. This is intended to be a bi-directional termination insensitive amplifier. A lot of the motivation for these termination insensitive amplifiers is, is sort of based on the work of uh, Ashar Farhan, VU2ESE, uh, VU2 uh, and his BIDX transceiver. Uh, and the intention was that you would sort of use these bi-directional amplifiers and turn on and turn off certain parts of them so that you could reuse whole parts of your circuitry for transmit and receive. You know, if you turn on the receive amplifiers, you've got your usual super head going one way out to a speaker, but if you turn on the amplifiers going the other way, you've got your microphone, your first mixer, IF, and out to the antenna. Uh, so by making these stages that are easy to turn on or turn off to pass signals one direction or the other, uh, it makes the construction of this kind of transceiver very simple. And that's exactly what Mr. or Mrs. Red Eye Prep has done. Uh, so the intention here is that you would only turn on uh, either these V, B, or V, A uh, voltage ports toward, uh, toward 12 volts uh, and clamp the other ones to ground to selectively turn on or turn off parts of the circuit. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about termination and sensitive amplifiers today. Uh, feel free to drop me a comment down below and let me know all the things I got wrong, and I will see you next time.